Support for these programs has been provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional support has been provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman & Wakefield, Douglaston Development, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Madison Realty Capital, Markham LLP, Marcus and Millichap Real Estate Investment Services, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, The Moynian Group, Newmark Knight Frank, SJP Properties, Siami Development, Sterling and Sterling Inc., RAL Companies and Affiliates, LLC, Spandrel Property Services, Urban American. They call it Dumbo, uh, you know, down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass. You know, how many people would think of developing under the Manhattan Bridge overpass? But, you know, how many people who grew up in Rochester have such interesting lives? I'm fortunate to have the, the chairman, the, the, the co-founder, the, the visionary guy who started a company called Two Trees. David Walentis, thank you for being here. So, you were born in Rochester. I was. Dad was a postman? Then my father worked for the post office. And your mother was a... She was a housewife. But then something happened. Five years of age, Dad had a stroke. Yes. Uh -huh. What happened? What, what, what happened to you? You were, uh, you were sent out to the farms, you said to me? I was, I was somewhere between a, an orphan and indentured slave at age six. My father had a stroke. We were, you know, poor, low middle class. Um, so my mother had to take care of my father and work, and she couldn't take care of my brother and I. And we were literally farmed out to these farm families that someone knew in places like Dansville and Red Creek. And um, I actually lived on a farm with an outhouse and a pump in the kitchen. Right, and you told me that. Uh <laughs> On the weekends, on Saturday, you would pump the water and you'd be able to take a bath. Pump the water out of the cistern, heat it on the wood stove, pour it into a tub on the kitchen floor, take a bath once a week, whether you need it or not. And so your dad died at 15. You came back to live with your mom. Yes. And uh, then, as you said, you, you really never knew anyone who went to college. No. You never knew anyone who went to college. and. You were gonna. You were a pretty good athlete in high school. You you ran, and you said you looked at a book of where you could get the ROTC program, uh, for where you get a scholarship. Right. It was a Navy ROTC scholarship. Actually, I was I was in the principal's office because I got kicked out for being what they called fresh in those days. Um, so it was a poster, and it had Navy ROTC for your scholarship. I said, that's for me. Um, so I took the test. On the back of the test, it had 50 schools that had the program. Number one was Harvard. So you had to pick one, so it was alphabetical, and I'd heard of Harvard. So then, being a smart kid and up in Rochester, I said, I've got to pick a school that nobody ever heard of. It's warm down south. So down near the bottom, it said University of Virginia. I'd never heard of it. So I ended up at UVA. Now, Just how luck. did you decide to do mechanical engineering? Well, this was 1956, um, and that's what smart kids did in those days. So 
I got a degree in mechanical engineering. Yeah, but before you got the degree, you know, you, you know, you were in the uh, the principal's office in public school, high school, and you, you got into the the dean's yeah. office <laughs> in college too, right? Yeah, perfect, perfect record. Per, per, right. Perfect, uh, three for three. You know, three, perfect okay. record. Okay. But you got in there, and um, they threw you. Uh, you were asked to leave temporarily for. Um, Unbecoming uh, conduct. Uh, Con conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman, as University of Virginia students were gentlemen and, and an you officer. Were, and you were ROTC, you were ROTC. Navy uh, Reserve, yeah. So I, for, it was for a trip down to Holland's College Girls School, which um, unfortunately the incident wouldn't get an honorable mention today, but in those days. So you left uh, University of Virginia, went back to Rochester to work, make some money. And then you came back to... I came back to the University of Virginia. And you graduate. Borrowed some money, worked, graduated. And now you again have no money, right? Right. So what happens then? You, you well, I, Greenland? I, I took I mean, a job... I mean, this is not a place for a kid from Rochester. Right. I took a job as a laborer at, working for a construction company at Thule Greenland, the Air Force Base, on a military contract. And my job was cleaning septic tanks. We would take the top off jump in, clean it off, scrape it down, paint it. Uh, free room, room and board at the uh, air base. Tuberg beer was nickel a can. Uh, so I spent, I don't know, six months there. We went up in June, it was midnight sun. We played softball at midnight. I left in November, it was 24 hours of darkness. And then you, <coughs> Casablanca. Or, uh... right. So then I ended up in Madrid with my brother who was in the Air Force and spent a couple of months there. Um, ran out of money in about March and ended up in Casablanca with my Volkswagen, my 60s bug, and would go down to the docks every day trying to find a ship that would let me work my way back so what happened to New York. You found, uh, I uh, to, you, you know, I watched Indiana Jones, you know, he found <laughs> the ship, uh, you know, for the Temple Dome, but... I found a Danish freighter, a little Danish freighter, and talked the captain into letting me work my way back to New York, and and I talked him into bringing my Volkswagen, and we, we came under the Verrazano Bridge. Verrazano Bridge. They were building it. We docked someplace in Brooklyn. They took the Volkswagen off the deck. We drove off the dock. We just kind of waved to the guard. I actually went downtown, lower Manhattan, sold a pint of blood for $10, filled up my Volkswagen, and drove back to Rochester. That's, a, that's so a true story. So you're up in Rochester and you think about joining the Peace Corps? Yeah, I met a, I met a guy in Casablanca that was a founder. This was 1962. Um, so I actually applied to the Peace Corps and was accepted. And I also applied to Darden Business School. And at the University I, of Virginia. The University of Virginia and got accepted there. So I passed on the Peace Corps. I was supposed to go to Bolivia. And, um, so, so you graduate 64, so now the kid from Rochester has a degree in mechanical engineering and a master's in business. And what do you do? You go to work for Singer what? Sewing Machine? Yeah. No, no, you went Singer. Zero. No, it wasn't no, it was Singer it? Sewing Machine. Singer yeah, I, I worked at Xerox when I was in Rochester right. that year off. Um, they were the only company that offered me a job overseas, and I wanted to pay off my loans and see the world. So I. I worked in Australia and Japan for about a year and a half, and then I actually quit and came back to New York because I didn't want to be an expatriate, and I really just wanted to be a real estate developer. Yeah, and but that, but even, but you know, you said to me, and you know, one of my favorite games also, but I, I you know, is the Parker Brothers game Monopoly. And I just noticed I got an iPad, and they even have a Monopoly game over there. So you know, I, I think I have to get the game. But, you know, p people learn, you know, the monopoly. They want to play there, you know, go to Boardwalk, you know. Then you get Baltic and you get all these little cities. So they're not the best. Right. You, no, you uh, want you wanted the red and the green. You want the green and the uh, the blue over there. I want, no, I like the, I like the orange and, you the, like the, and orange. the light blue. You like the orange and light blue. As long as you didn't hit the excise tax. But what happened was you were working for Pete Morrow Mitchell as a consultant, right? When I quit and came back right, to get a job and pay the rent, I was actually staying with, with a friend from business school, Jan Mursky, and sleeping on his couch, and, and I got a job with Pete Marwick. Right, you consultant. met Jan at University of Virginia, yes. right? Now, the interesting thing is, as you said, you wanted to get into real estate, and what you would do, like, 
you would walk around, look at buildings on the evenings and on, on the weekends. And I mean, you found the building. I mean, on 104th Street? 104th Manhattan Avenue. Manhattan Avenue, uh, an avenue which is still a rough neighborhood today. It's better today, but, but we made the classic, classic real estate mistake. We bought, the, we bought the best building in the worst spot. Um, 60 apartments, something yeah, like that? Yeah, it was a 60 or 70 now, apartments. Now, the interesting and thing, and this you know, really makes how Two Trees was, so you came up with, let's say, $20,000 from savings. Jan came up with 10000 and you needed, oh wait, you first went to Citibank and asked for a loan. Right. And they right. said, what they did they say? They threw me out. They, they threw, threw you me out. So, um. so they threw you out. So now Mursky and Walentis, Mursky had this friend by the name of Jeff Byers. Now, Jeff Byers was really, I mean, this guy, father, grandfather, great grandfather, they all went to Yale. He was I mean, pedigree. He was true pedigree. He wasn't the, a ruffian from uh, Rochester, New York. And he was very good looking. He was actually on the New York Times best dress list. Yeah, so th this young guy who probably was about 28 or 29, uh, who worked originally for Lehman Brothers. Yes. He worked for Shearson Lehman. Um, he comes in, he gives you 20. So the, so the three of you buy this building. Right. Jan, Jan had worked with Jeff at, at, uh, at Lehman. At, no, at, at W.R. Grace. W.R. Grace. And actually, Peter Grace was Jeff's Father. uncle or uncle something, right? Uncle, I think. So now you go out there and you create with Jeff an entity called Two Trees, which was named after the farm. It was his grandmother's. It was Granny Grace's farm in Aiken, South Carolina, which was a polo facility. And during that time, your first building was where? After that one, you bought, you we, came Midtown, you went to Right, we came, we, are, we, we made our mistake. Um, you want to buy the worst building in the best spot instead of the best building in the worst spot. Anyway, we bought 309 West 57th Street, um, which was a residential hotel that had very small apartments. Um, and then we bought 55 Park, um, which is 38th and Park, it was 15 stories, two apartments to a floor. I think we paid... Six hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> and you and basically the job was, as it was written, you you ran the business, and it was Jeff's job to raise money. Yes, I literally worked out of my apartment. Um, we didn't have a staff. I was, which was very good because that's how you met Jane later right. on in life, uh, your your wife. So what happens is it's nineteen seventy seven, the world has got a little tougher. Another one of the recessions, and. Um, uh, December 31st, 1977, your partner decided to um, end his life. Yes. Uh, so uh, so two trees had one tree left. Well, that was a, a tragedy. We were, actually, we were actually in Mexico at the time, and my mother, we left my, Jed was an infant, and we left him with, with my mother in Phoenix, and the weather was terrible, so we went to Mexico. And, but we didn't even know about it until we came back about the 2nd or 3rd of January. My mother met us at the airport and said, here's the New York Times. Jeff jumped out the window. We were shocked. Yeah. So now you bought Je uh, Jeff's estate later on. You, had, you were involved with the Silk Building where you know, uh, Keith Richards was involved. And it's, you know, you're, one day you were down at the Silk Building, you told me, right? And you met some, you asked this kid, where's the next neighborhood? What was that? Well, we were early in Soho. Um, and then we went to NoHo and, and bought the Silk Building. We actually named it the Silk Building, and then it became the Rock and Roll Building. We right, brought became, be, be Tower, Tower Records, Records and right. Keith Richards, and we brought them all to New York. Uh, so I said, you know, Soho, NoHo, what's next? And one of the artists, one of the kids said, Dumbo. I said, where the hell is Dumbo? <coughs> so you get in your red uh, car. Little red Mercedes. A little red Mercedes, and you ride to the... Uh, to this restaurant, Buzzo, River Cafe. The River yeah. Cafe. You have lunch at the River Cafe, and you see down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass, Dumbo or Fulton Landing or whatever we could call it. Right, it was really an acronym. The, the neighborhood is really between the Brooklyn Manhattan Bridges, the river, and the BQE. But someone made up that acronym, which which I thought was terrific. And everybody said, "Oh, how can you call it Dumbo? You know, we'll call it Fulton Landing." 
So for a long time it was Fulton Landing, and then... So what happens? You see a building, what do you do? Well, we saw one little building, a real estate sign, Helmsley Spear, uh, Earl Altman, his name was on it, I called Earl, I said, Mr. Altman, I'm David Lennis, little building, he said, we'll sell it to you, $10 a foot, it was about 80,000 feet. I said, well, you know, you can't buy one building, somebody should buy the whole neighborhood. It's all these great industrial buildings, great views. He said, we own them. We have 2 million square feet. We'll sell it to you, $12 million, um, $6 a foot. <laughs> Seems like a bargain today. No but, question. But I was the dumb and dumbo for a long now, time. Now, the interesting thing on that was uh, Jane, who was working for Estee Lauder. Right, she was an art director. She was an art director at Estee Lauder, was friendly with Lauders, and basically... You had met them through the years. Yeah, Jane worked for Ronald. They were the same age. Um, and also, Ronald uh, has a great art collection, and, and he and Jeff became friends, and, and that's how Ronald got involved with the Museum of Modern Art. Um, but also, the Lauders were partners with me in, in the Silk Building, so we, we did well with that, and so we said, you know, come to Dumbo. So I'll never forget, we took, Ronald was all up for it, um, but we took Leonard over, and Leonard was more conservative, and the, there were studs on the Brooklyn Bridge at the time, and there was a wine, and it was a big, vacant neighborhood, and Ronald, or Leonard looked at me, and he said, Zeckendorf went broke with projects like this, what are you talking about? Anyway, they came up with the, with the money, they came up with six million dollars. And, and you had a six million dollar uh, mortgage? Mortgage, and... Yeah. So, th so then what happens? We bought a neighborhood. You bought a neighborhood, but it took a little while to develop the neighborhood. It's been, it's been 32 years. What happened at the initial time? You were trying to develop Well, it. initially we just, you know, we're running to, to tertiary kinds of manufacturing and record storage businesses. And then we started to rent to artists that were getting pushed out of Manhattan. Um, and then we, we had a plan, the city and state then had a plan to develop the waterfront and, and we were designated the developer of the waterfront, which we wanted to do to make our neighborhood more valuable. Um, but then Ed Koch was elected mayor and, and Ken Lipper became his deputy mayor and Ken had been partners with us in a couple of deals. But he was successful in those, uh, those deals. He made money on those. He deals. made money in those deals, but for some reason he blamed me for Jeff's death and he de-designated us and went after us. And, and subsequently, Cuomo was out there to help. Right, right. Cuomo had come down there, and, and you know, I guess the mayor and the governor have their issues. Um, so Cuomo wanted to protect the manufacturing jobs there and get credit for that. And so he cut a deal with us to, to extend all the manufacturing leases for 10 years in exchange for that. Um, we got the Department of Labor out of the World Trade Center, um, and then and that was the biggest lease in Brooklyn ever, right? I think so at and that it was, time. It was the biggest lease ever signed in Brooklyn before um, MetroTech. Um, so so that worked, and then after Lipper left the city, Larry Townsend uh, was very supportive, and we got we got a city agency to take the Sweeney Building, and so so it evolved kind of as a as a back office and, and, and then, artist neighborhood. And then, uh, then basically uh, uh, Ronald became an ambassador. His right. position was taken over by Jeff Gorrell, the Gorrell family, and Arthur, and, Cohn. and Arthur Cohn. So when did you start really changing the nature of, of Dumbo? About 12 years ago, the, the city finally allowed the zoning to change for manufacturing, which prohibited residential. They recognized the value of after Soho and NoHo that people would stay in the city and live in these industrial buildings and, and create you know, housing for middle class families to stay in the city. Uh, so about 12 years ago, we, we got the zoning changed to permit residential. And what was the first building you converted? The first building was one main. Uh, we'd, the Department of Labor had moved out. We bought the mortgage back from the bank that had gone bankrupt. Um, we converted it to, to great condominium apartments. 
and we were selling them for three, four hundred thousand dollars, and today they're selling for a million, a million and a half, two million. And then, then there's the Sweeney building. And Sweeney and 70 Washington, and we've really created a right, whole a true neighborhood. neighborhood. I mean, with the retail stores and everything over there. The retail we had, you know, we had all this vacant ground floor space. So, in order to to make the neighborhood and encourage retailers, um, we gave them all free rent for a year or two. Jacques Torrey and my Korean market and um, a French wine store and flaky girl that opened a little restaurant and a uh, orthodox kid that has a copy center. <laughs> they were all, all entrepreneurs, you know. But then you, you know, so, you, I mean, with all this in Dumbo, then you, you said, hey, I'm in Brooklyn as it is. And you, I mean, you had other properties also, but then you went to 110 Livingston Street, right? 110 Livingston Street was downtown Brooklyn. It's a great Stanford White building. The, the Board of Education. Building. Board of Education was there. Um, so the city put it up for auction. Uh, we bought it, I think, for, I don't know, 40 or $50 million and converted it to 300 uh, condos. It's a great building. We added some, some space to the top. Um, it's on the edge of the heights. We knew it was in transition. Um, and we also built the, the uh, courthouse building on the corner of, of Court and Atlantic. Uh, which again we bought from the city. They put it up for auction, and it was a big municipal parking garage. And we built 300 um, apartments there, a big 80/20, probably the and first 80/20. And, and then Brooklyn. you're also the landlord for Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's. You we brought, brought Trader, Trader Joe's to Brooklyn. We, yeah, we really helped that. We brought Trader Joe's to Brooklyn. Um, we just uh, Barney's Co-op just moved in behind Trader Joe's, Urban Outfitters we brought to Atlantic Avenue. Um, we, yeah, we've had a big impact on. And, and to, you know, and today you, you, you're continuing to build. I mean, in Brooklyn, you and Jed are building what now? The new, We're uh, building 100, 100 apartments, uh, renovation, a big renovation of a brick and heavy timber building on the waterfront next to the, next to the Manhattan Bridge. Uh, Jed's building a hotel in Williamsburg, a little boutique hotel, and but I think you have a you know you have a small little project on 11th Avenue and 53rd, 54th, <laughs> 2006. You decided to buy something from Verizon. Well, we we had we had made some money and we had a lot of cash and and so we we bid on this big parking lot on 11th Avenue between 53rd and 54th Street and um, I'll never forget we met with Verizon and. And they had a lot of big developers there, and Jed and I kind of were there in our jeans and shirts. And, and he said, like, was wait, 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 your shirt show me, you know. The, so, no guts, no, no glory. God. Okay, so. <laughs> I have to remind myself. Right, so. So we go to the meeting, and they say, you know, the bid was 130 million cash. Um, they said, who are you guys? You know, who are your partners? Who are your banks? Who do you have to get approved? I said, just mark up the contract. We'll sign it. We don't need anybody's approval. Um, so they sold it to us because everybody else was subject to. And so we had this big site. It was own manufacturing, but we had, we'd talked to the... the stables the were there, too. Community people. No, no stables. There were stables around the corner for some, yeah. some carriage horses. But the city was looking for, for stables for their police horses. Uh, so we met with Christine Quinn and the community and... Yeah, but Mercedes was unhappy about their space. On Mercedes, 41st. right. Well, it's, it is Automotive Row, and Mercedes had been looking for a new space for, for a long time. So they have that space on 41st that gets tied up with the tunnel traffic and you can't get so, to so, it. So you built them, what, a 330,000 square foot? Well, three, 270,000 feet below grade. We dug a big hole. It's a 100,000 foot site. We went down three levels for their service and prep and storage. And then they have a 50,000 foot two level showroom on the avenue. So um, that's their retail condo. That's, we sold them a retail condo. We just closed a couple of weeks ago for $190 million. Um, and now we're building the apartments. The first phase of the apartments are under construction. How many units are you building over there? There'll be a, almost 1,000, I think 950. The first phase is 220 which is the low-rise section, and then next year we're going to start the, 
the second phase. The first phase will, will start occupying in May, and then we'll start the, the remainder probably in June. And then you decided to buy an office building recently? We bought a, well, we bought a little loft building down on 23rd Street. Um, nice, nice building, 23rd between 5th and 6th. Great location. Um, big, you know, loft office building with, with large tenants, including a public school. And, um, it's about 330,000 feet, I think. Um, so we're, we're active and... You know, we have about two minutes left. How do you meet Jane? You tell me the story. <laughs> it's a great story. I was, I was separated and living at 55 Park, working out of my apartment, and and I had a rental agent for the building at 308, 308. West 57th Street, and we, there were little studio apartments. And so I said, look, at, you know, I just want to rent to good-looking young women. I said, tell them they have to be interviewed by the landlord. So he was sending me women and Jane came over and knocked on the door and I had my Bermuda shorts on and a t-shirt and she says, is Mr. Willanis here? And I said, I am Mr. Willanis. <laughs> um, so that's how we met. Um, Been I married? We, I think we had dinner that night. Been married how many years now? Better we get it right. Married, I don't know, Jed's 36. We've been together 40 years. We've probably been married 38 years. Great. She's the best. So, you know, for this kid, you know, who <clears throat> probably everybody thought, what a troublemaker, he'd never be anything, you know, from uh, digging ditches, like, and, uh, you know, doing every job. I don't know. I was always very ambitious in a quiet way. You know, I just kept going. Um, they call me relentless. I don't. I don't and, and that's why you're up. a true builder of New York, and thanks for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Support for these programs has been provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's window company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional support has been provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Douglaston Development, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns & Gian Tomasi, Grubb & Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa & Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Madison Realty Capital, Markham LLP, Marcus and Millichap Real Estate Investment Services, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, The Moynian Group, Newmark Knight Frank, SJP Properties, Siami Development, Sterling and Sterling Inc., RAL Companies and Affiliates, LLC, Spandrel Property Services, Urban American.